Leaked Whitehall analysis published by BuzzFeed News says that the UK economy will grow more slowly outside the EU, no matter what deal is struck with Brussels. Some Brexit-supporting MPs swiftly rejected the findings, with the likes of Ian Duncan Smith calling it incomplete and deliberately leaked because it gives a bad view. Government sources say that its preferred bespoke trade deal option wasn't included and that the UK will not be worse off outside the EU. Meanwhile, The Sun newspaper reports comments from the International Trade Secretary Liam Fox that Eurosceptic colleagues need to live with disappointment and accept that the Tories don't have a working majority. Dr Fox has since issued a clarification saying that his comments were instead directed against those plotting against Mrs May. It comes as the government prepares for a legislative showdown in the Lords, where the EU withdrawal bill is set to be debated for the first time. Almost 200 peers are expected to speak in the debate, although no votes are expected to take place until later next month. In Brussels, meanwhile, the EU agreed its negotiating guidelines for the transition period. The EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, said the UK would continue to accept all EU rules, including rule changes adopted after March 2019, but that it would not be involved in any decision-making. Downing Street, however, insists there will be a negotiation on the transition period. Well, joining us now is the Conservative MP Stephen Hammond, who lost his job as vice chairman of the party after he rebelled against the government and voted for an amendment to the EU withdrawal bill, calling for a meaningful vote. Welcome to The Daily Politics. Let's talk about the um, analysis that's been leaked. Before the referendum, George Osborne, the then Chancellor, based on Treasury analysis, told us a vote to leave would spark a year-long recession. It would cost 820,000 jobs within two years. And David Cameron said Brexit would put a bomb under the British economy. Those fears were wrong then. Why shouldn't they be wrong now? Well, those fears were wrong then. Uh, and I'm pleased that they, uh, so many people stay in their jobs. But the last set of economic news was it showed slightly better growth, also showed that we'd gone from the fastest growing to the slowest growing economy around and also it showed of course that we saw the slowest growth for five years. The reason why I think this is embarrassing for the government today is that first of all this was a confidential cross Whitehall uh, paper that was shown to ministers confidentially so someone's leaked it that's embarrassing and secondly it does show a consensus that whatever option you look at unfortunately our economy will grow less fast when we leave the EU. Right, and you've talked about the leak and how embarrassing it is. Isn't it suspect, the timing of the leak? I mean, Nigel Evans, one of your colleagues, says it's part of a dirty tricks campaign leaked by someone who wants the softest of Brexit. Well, Nigel, I'm not going to comment on what Nigel said. I don't think it's a, it's, it's a piece of paper that's just started round Whitehall. Yeah. I don't know why it was leaked. But what we should be looking at is what it actually says. And what it actually says, under whatever option you choose to look at, and whichever one they've modelled, it, the UK economy will grow less strongly than had otherwise happened. But predicted. you yourself have said that the initial fears um, that were warned by politicians in the immediate aftermath of the Brexit and EU referendum, they haven't been realised. So, I mean, how strongly can you believe that predictions made for 15 years' time are highly speculative? Well, of course, you can't be absolutely precise about any detail in any forecast of anything. Right. So we you, well, hold on, but hold on, it. hold on. There is a really important point here. First of all, this is not one department like it was last time. This is economists looking at all departments, so it's a much wider range of economists agreeing. Whichever option you leave, the trend is clear. So it may or may, whatever you say about the absolute detail, the trend is clear here. And that's what should be worrying uh, everyone out there, but also should be worrying the policymakers in government to make sure that we get a Brexit that works for Britain. Right, but if you say the detail, and the detail's important here when we're talking about whether the economy will grow more slowly than predicted, we're supposed to believe that the Treasury can accurately predict something 15 years in advance, and yet this report has already changed from the one issued before the referendum. So they've already revised down the warnings. Well, this, 
This is a new report, as I understand it. And for goodness sake, the whole point that we should now be saying, of course, is the government must now publish this so we can actually see the detail so that you and I don't have to speculate on it. But this is a new report looking at the latest information compiled by economists from, every, from as many departments as I understand that exist across Whitehall. And the trend is very clear here, and it's a worrying trend. And therefore, what we must want to see is the government to look at an option that keeps Britain in a customs union or after. Right. Isn't it important, though, to realise, you say there is a clear trend, but not one of the models that has been set out actually includes the one where Britain negotiates a bespoke, a tailor-made deal. Uh, that hasn't been included, so... Well, no, that's true. But what, of course, has been modelled, according to the leaks, is a comprehensive free trade deal with the EU, which presumably is what that model will be. And it has also modelled the benefits of doing outside deals. It says that the economy will grow less slowly under a comprehensive free trade deal by, by 2%, and the benefits of those trade deals will be 0.6%. So even if you take that, uh, what you've suggested isn't there at the moment, it doesn't look great at the moment. However, the government can resolve this quite easily by publishing the analysis and also telling people what it actually wants in its bespoke deal. Right. Well, what do you want the government to do now on the basis of this information? What do you think should happen? Well, I want the government to negotiate a bespoke deal, but I want that deal to ensure that we have closely aligned regulatory equivalents for financial services and services, which are our biggest earner. I want to see us in a customs union that allows us to trade freely still with our European colleagues, but allows us also to look at some of those relatively small but worthwhile benefits from outside trade deals. Do you think we're getting closer to a position where the public should be consulted again? Uh, I, don't, I think a lot of the public want the, want the government to set out its, its direction and are willing the government to get on with this and do it well. Right, but the answer to my question, do you think there, we're moving closer to a position where the public... Well, there will be... Uh, lots of people have called for that since we've had the first referendum. I'm certainly not calling for that. What I'd like, though, is the <coughs> government to look at a comprehensive deal that keeps Britain in a customs union and allows us to make sure that we're closely aligned with the EU regulatory system so that our services industry can continue to prosper. But Stephen Hammond, people out there heard the doom and gloom that was given to them in the run-up to the EU referendum, and they still voted to leave in defiance of all those warnings and the forecasts. Do you think this will really change their minds? Well, people out there were told there was going to be £330 million for the NHS a week, uh, and that clearly wasn't right either. Uh, and so I think a lot of people voted on that basis. Do you agree with your colleague Anna Subri that Theresa May needs to control and get a grip of the arch Eurosceptics in your party? Well, I think where Anna's right is that it would be helpful for the government to set out its position so everybody can be clear what its position is. And I hope that that position will be that the government rejects a hard Brexit and opts for a Brexit that is in the economic prosperity of this country. Do you still have faith in Theresa May to negotiate the best deal for Britain? I, have, I, I am clear that Mrs May has the option to do so and will do so. And um, I'm clear that that deal should be a customs union, closely regulated, uh, close regulatory equivalents, uh, and so that we can get the best economic uh, outcome for the people. We want secure people to have secure jobs post-Brexit, uh, opportunity of a good future and a better Britain. Right, you don't sound totally convinced that Theresa May is the best equipped to actually negotiate what will be a very difficult trade deal with the EU. Well, I think that was a pre-scripted question. I think I was pretty unequivocal, frankly. Right. So you have... She's got your full support. Yeah, I want the Prime Minister to succeed. Right. And should she name her departure date um, to help bring and unify the party? Only if she judges that to unify the party. And what do you think? Well, I think that there has been a lot of speculation about that. I think the Prime Minister may wish to make her intentions clear. All right. Stephen Hammond, thank you very much. Well, Conservative MP and leading Eurosceptic Bernard Jenkin is with me now. Um, Bernard, it looks like the government's been sitting on this report, and you can see why. I mean, it's pretty damning in every respect, as far as the economy is concerned, for Brexit. Well, I mean, we've been here before. I mean, to some extent, um, <clears throat> I don't entirely blame the BBC for this, but... Um, government economists think Brexit is bad for Britain. You know, it's not exactly a very big story, is it? Um, they were wrong, as you pointed out in your interview with Stephen. Mm. Completely wrong. I mean, we didn't lose 800,000 jobs. We've more or less created 800,000 jobs since the vote. Um, uh, the trend has been completely in the opposite direction. And, yes, the economy's uh, 
growth has slowed a bit, but that was after a long and sustained period of economic growth, uh, when, uh, when the IMF, for example, was saying that Gordon, George Osborne's policy was going to damage economic growth. These economists are so often wrong. Also, it's very important to understand the government uses what they call a gravity economic model. They factor in changes, um, but they don't factor in what the policy response is and what the other things the government might do to, refer, to mitigate against those changes. And finally, I would just point out, actually, the government's policy, as they have said, is not reflected in any of these forecasts. Their, their objective of a bespoke deal, as you've pointed out. Which I put so, to your you know, colleague. But just because the forecasts were wrong in your mind during the referendum campaign doesn't actually mean that these ones are, no, it doesn't, doesn't automatically right. follow, does I it? Can't, I can't absolutely prove that. Right. But on the basis of, you know, the 364 legendary economists who attacked Margaret Thatcher's economic policy in the early 1980s, they all proved to be wrong and the government, the gov you know, the Treasury at that time was, was very, very scared of Margaret Thatcher's economic policy. All the advice that the, that the government got about if, what would happen to our economy if we didn't join the euro, they all proved wrong. I mean, you know... We know we are, the, the British establishment has always had a pro-EU policy. Right. What and they've you, always what, tried to prove the point by producing economic forecasts. What do you say to that? So where Bernard is broadly right is that actually the message that this will be bad for the economy has been very consistent. So prior to the referendum in April 2016, there was some forecasts that actually were sort of directionally the same as these forecasts now. So I agree. I, I'm not convinced this is hugely newsworthy in that sense. Uh, I, I think also if you look at what the Leave voters said, there was a poll of 12,000 Leave voters uh, on the day of uh, of the referendum, and just 6% thought that there would be better economic prospects outside of the EU. Uh, I, where Bernard, I think, is wrong uh, is to somehow claim that putting up barriers between us and our largest trading partner, uh, and but not only doing that, also the EU has 50 trade deals around the world, and that's how we access those markets, that somehow that is going to be good for the economy. And I think what the consensus is amongst all economists, pretty much, with the exception of a very small number, uh, is that this isn't going to be good for the British economy. And I, I, it's a perfectly respectable position to say it's not good for the economy, uh, but there are other reasons to want to vote to leave. But I don't think you can sustain the position that somehow leaving the European Union is in our economic interest. You may see other arguments you know, are, are more important than that, but it's, it's hard to sustain that point Do you accept that, that on the economic argument, um, Brexit doesn't present a convincing case? Well, um, uh, people who are against leaving the European Union constantly attribute to us um, things that we haven't said. We don't want to put up unnecessary barriers to trade with the EU. That is not, that is not what the government wants. It's not what anyone who supported leave wants. And uh, if there are barriers between our trade, it's because they're going to be erected by the EU. Now, that may be a consequence of us leaving. Well, but, but yes, you're right. In the end, people voted leave because they wanted to take back control. So and that is not that. that, that is, can, but, I, can I pick but, you up on that? Then? But if we, uh, we are perfectly capable of taking back control of our own destiny and making the most of our economic opportunities. And personally, I have complete confidence in the future of this country. Even when which, Liam Fox, example, who, Stephen, well, even when Liam Fox, your colleague, who is broadly on the same side as you and who is scoping out free trade deals once we leave um, the European Union, has said you need to prepare yourself for disappointment because well, you're not going to get the vision. That. Well, um, uh, he, he's, he's, he said he was talking about something else. I don't know what he really means by that. He certainly hasn't made a speech or made a big pronouncement. Do you think but, he would uh, be wrong if he was saying... I mean, will you take his advice? I mean, are you worried about this idea of well, having to accept a softer I, Brexit? I have no idea what he meant by that. Uh, I think he's being misinterpreted. I mean, let him come on the television and say leaving the EU is going to be bad for the economy. I don't think he will say that. He didn't say leaving no, the e no, EU. Exactly. Well, I haven't said exactly. that. What he did say is, well, then what reportedly, is preparing. You need to prepare yourselves for a disappointment and have to accept a softer Brexit. I think what he was, may have been talking about is that we have to accept that there will be um, a, a protracted and rather unpleasant um, transition period, uh, implementation period, when, when we're going to have to accept quite a lot of um, un unpalatable restrictions on what we can do. And will you we're accept it? We're going to have it? to pay this money. Well, so long as we get out at the end of it, um, full regulatory autonomy, the ability to do trade deals with other countries, um, I think then we will arrive at the end of it in the best possible position because we don't want to sort of poke two fingers in the rest of the eyes of the European Union. Uh, we want to leave on amicable terms and we want to leave on terms 
where there is cooperation. So you will accept the you will accept their negotiating position of Britain having to abide by new rules during that transition period, and will have no input well, in the decision. Well, I support making. the Prime Minister rather more unambiguously than Stephen Hammond, who. Uh, he wants to be in a customs union when we come out of the European Union. Actually, to be in a customs union or the customs union is, frankly, a distinction without a difference. And I agree with the Prime Minister, who has rejected the government's guide, the, the EU guidelines produced yesterday. Uh, she does not want to be unambiguously unqualified rule taker during that British transition period. She does not want to have. Uh, untrammeled free movement of people during the transition period. She so, has rejected so you're what not, the EU has offered yesterday. So you're not and concerned? Actually, that's actually a much bigger story than this non-story about what a few government economists think. Well, if it is a non-story, do you think it should all be published? And then I, we can I, see, for example, with the methodology. I, of course it should be published, and then we'll be able to see exactly what methodology they've used. This is what the government did not do during the referendum, the George Osborne and David Cameron. Mm. They did not produce the methodology of their forecasts. We had to work them out or, or dig them out. And we found out that they too had used this gravity economic model that led to these very jaundiced forecasts because the, their forecasts assume no policy response. Well, why it's do you... a matter of economic debate um, that we can have as to whether you know, this is going to be negative for the British All right, economy so you want it published. I mean, why hasn't but the government published it? I mean, do you think this has been leaked in I terms of a dirty tricks any, campaign? I don't think the government had any intention of publishing it. I suspect a minister, a SPAD or an official has leaked this, not published it, in order to try and carry on the fear campaign that has been, I mean, much of the government uh, seems to be still promoting the fear campaign, which, of course, didn't win the referendum for the very reasons that, that have just been described, because actually people were thinking about constitutional and democratic factors as much as economic factors. Is there a drift towards a softer Brexit? Well, the, I don't think from the Prime Minister. I think the Prime no, Minister has But is said. there a general drift well, towards... I think, I think there, are, there, there are people in the government, like the Chancellor of the Exchequer, as we said last Friday, um, who are trying to blow government policy in a different direction. I think this is the terrible difficulty the Prime Minister is having. Um, but coming back to, you know, where the Conservative Party sits on this, the vast majority of Conservative MPs, like, I think, the vast majority of people in business in this country, want us to get on with this, want to reduce the period of uncertainty to as limited a period as, pos as possible and get on with availing ourselves of the opportunities. They don't so, want this dragged out year after year yeah. after year. I mean, so the, the, there is just no majority in Parliament for a Brexit at any cost, this sort of ultra-hard Brexit. So I think, I think that's the problem that Bernard is picking up on. There's no majority in Parliament for that position, uh, but the uh, Conservative Party doesn't have a majority uh, that is strong enough to just push through any particular single position. You're seeing that impasse between those people who say mm. we must compromise and those people who say no compromise. And there's not much of a compromise between no compromise and a compromise. Well, can, can I just deal with that? Because, you see, what will keep the Conservative Party in office is broad unity in the Conservative Party. There are far more people who are broadly sympathetic to my view in the Conservative Party. But you're the one who's also been attacking number. the Chancellor, There's Philip Hammond, and that well, doesn't help unity I think, either. I think the problem that the Prime Minister somewhat made for herself is that um, the majority of people in, in the Cabinet, she does not actually have a majority for her policy in her Cabinet. And I think that is Bernard, making life very difficult for you just said you need unity her. in the Conservative yes, Party, and then but, you've just been pointing out no, no, the divisions but, within it. I mean, but actually, the, that so is slightly so the, surreal. The, point, the, point, the balance of opinion in the Cabinet does not reflect the balance of opinion in the Parliamentary Party. Well, when did Philip Hammond say he didn't want to leave the single market in the customs union? Well, um, he praised the speech of the... Let's not go over this again, but he praised the speech of the CBI, which was unambiguously arguing that we should remain in a customs union. And, and you just heard Stephen Hammond saying he's, he's promoting that policy. That, that is not the policy of the government. It's not the policy of the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has never hinted that we will be in a customs union after we've finally gone through the implementation. Do you think that could be the end result, though? So I do. I mean, before Christmas, uh, IPPR published its proposal for the shared market, said we should be in a customs union and align our regulatory regime uh, to the single market. That's since been adopted by the CBI as their position. Well, the CBI uh, you've is heard split others over this. talking talking about that position. I think that's probably where we'll land if we decide that we want to honour the referendum result uh, whilst also securing the economy. Well, and that seems like a very reasonable. And what will you do if that is? The, well, what will you do if that happens? Well, I mean, it's interesting when um, uh, Jeremy Hunt wrote an article just after the referendum well, result. He made it clear that if we were to finish up in something like this Norway model, uh, then there would have to be another referendum. And do you in, agree? In, um, 
Well, I think if the government is going to reverse the substantive decision taken by the British people that we would leave the European Union, leave the single market, leave the customs union, all the policies the government set out in the Lancaster House speech, all the policies that were in our manifesto, if we're going to reverse all that, it will, it will cause some eruptions. It will cause some serious <laughs> disturbance. And just, just bear, bear this in mind. One thing that we've seen is, the, is basically UKIP is destroyed because uh, the referendum has decided this matter. But if the government, the Br great British establishment, starts dragging this back to some half-in, half-out, botched Brexit, uh, there's going to be a very unhappy political situation in this whole country. The Conservatives... Well, what do you say? There'll be the end of the, the Conservative Party? The vast majority of the Conservative Party are aligned with the majority of the British people, and I believe the majority of real business people, not, not, not these um, sort but of... But are you saying unions. it will mark the end but, of the Conservative Party in government? Um, I, I think that... I mean, this is obviously very existential stuff um, for, the, um, for, for political parties. I mean, it's certainly the divisions in the Labour Party are just as serious sure. as in the Conservative Party. But when you say there's no majority in the House of We're Commons for a... Uh, 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 what you call a hard Brexit for honouring the result of the referendum. Um, actually, there was no majority in Parliament before the referendum for leaving the European Union at all. All right, on and that. Is that the, the opinion that's going to be reflected in what the outcome is? No, I think the Conservative Party reflects public opinion. We are, the vast majority of us united about that, and I think we'll produce a majority in Parliament in order to be able to implement it. Bernard Jenkins, thank you. Now, while all this.